ALS can make simple, everyday activities, such as walking, dressing, and driving, seem like monumental challenges. Fortunately, there are a number of devices and techniques that can make your life much easier. In this video, we'll go over some stretching exercises, and you'll see tools and learn tips that can help you with common, everyday tasks. We'll show you some adaptations you can make around your home, and we will present some solutions for the time when mobility may become more difficult. Using the techniques and devices shown in this video can help you maximize your independent function, as well as improve the quality of your life. This video is about mobility, activities of daily living, and home adaptations. It is designed to be used in conjunction with the ALS Association's Living with ALS Manual Number 4, Functioning When Your Mobility is Affected. Throughout this video, you'll see people with ALS using equipment that helps them be more independent. Your individual needs should be evaluated by your healthcare providers so they can assist you in choosing devices and techniques that are right for you. Be sure to consult your physician before using any of the equipment and before performing the exercises presented in this video. Pain can be a secondary effect of ALS. However, it can be minimized by the techniques you'll see next. If needed, over-the-counter medication for pain may be suggested by your healthcare professional. Changes in muscle strength and therefore your ability to fully use your joints and maintain your usual posture can lead to joint and muscle aches. You do not have to put up with these problems. They can either be prevented or managed. I've actually improved my shoulder through the exercise. I found that I can move my shoulder so that last year I couldn't swim and this year I could swim a little and that was exciting. ALS is generally considered uh, to be a painless disease. But as the disease becomes more advanced and as people become more immobile, pain becomes a problem. So immobility, which leads to inflexibility of the joints and the muscles, does lead to pain. More than 50% of people with ALS have pain in the advanced stages of the disease. A lot of that can be prevented by range of motion exercises, being as mobile as one can be, getting up on the feet when it's possible and walking. We cannot always replace the strength. We're not able to do that yet in ALS, but we can prevent the contractures and the immobility and the inflexibility that occur naturally with this disease. Fingers open, wrists back. Now make a fist, wrists down. Fingers open, wrists back. Hands open, down into the roof. Back into the claw. Down into a flat fist. Up into a full fist. We're gonna talk about doing range of motion to your shoulder. And for Mrs. Martola, the thing you need to make sure is that you've got good support on his arm. And you want to lift up his arm, you can either do it in this direction like this, or you can take your hands and cross them this way so that when you come up, you'll have them in a convenient way. You want to shift your body weight so that you're not having to do so much with your arms. This might be more convenient for you for your posture because you want to make sure that you have good body mechanics only have to do it two or three times in the whole day. So you just take your time and you can be watching TV, watching the news and going like this and you know when the commercial comes on do it till the com next commercial and then just come up like this. So it shouldn't be painful. You don't want it to be painful. You just want to go to where it's tight and then hold it. How was that Larry? It was fine. Okay. No pain, no gain. The best position would be for you to sit down here and then here. Uh huh. And then get the, the knee started. You want to probably change your hand position to come up to here. Uh huh. And then bring your body over. Can you slide a little bit so you're closer and not bending so much? And then straighten it up back down. You might want to scoop your hand underneath the knee again so you support it on the lowering. And then pull up again. Another exercise that, that you can do, and again, it's going to involve the hip is where you're just taking the leg and you're bringing it out to the side and back in. And you can use the same kind of support. You can put your hand right underneath his heel. Uh-huh. And again, you want to stretch. And the last exercise that, that is good to give you a stretch along the calf. And again, you want to be gentle with this, but you're going to place his whole heel in your hand. 
and then rest his foot on your forearm. You'll just bring your body weight forward so you're not really doing anything with your arm and you're just gently stretching in the back. Do you feel this in your calf? Water is a great medium in that when you're in water you're buoyant so you're able to do things that you can't do on land. There are some precautions though because with ALS you don't want to do any exercise program to fatigue. So when you swim do you get fatigued? I have to be careful. The first time I walked in water I felt like I was walking on water at the time because it felt so wonderful to be walking on my own and it was so easy that when I got out of the pool I didn't realize that how tired my legs would be. If the muscles supporting the joints become weak, there are a number of splints and braces that can maintain your correct anatomical position and help prevent pain from stiff or frozen joints. This is called a wrist cock-up splint. It's used to help position your hand during the day. Sometimes you can get a better grip when you have the support in your wrist and it allows you to hold things that are built up handles like spoons, your razor, your toothbrush. And it keeps your, your muscles and your tendons from being overstretched in this position. This is a resting hand splint and it's used when you wake up in the morning and your hands fisted, you can put your hand in here and there's straps that are put on the splint to keep your hand in a resting position. Canes and walkers are devices that can be very useful for people to improve their mobility when their legs start becoming quite weak. There's no downside to using them and they can prevent falls and improve the distance that a person can cover when the legs are weak. You're going to use your cane opposite your weaker side. Okay. okay? So it'll be cane and left foot, cane and left foot, body nice and tall, good. And you'll walk cane and left foot, good, cane and left foot. Cane and left foot. Very good. So with the walker, you just want to make sure that the height is right for you. That's the most important thing. Um, a lot of times, the walker is either too tall or too short. This is a perfect size for me and for you, so that the handle is right at the break of my hip, and my arm has a slight angle to it. Your arm should not be all the way straight. That means the walker is too small for you, and you shouldn't be bent up like this. So you want to be walking like that. You have a wheeled walker, so what's most important for you is that you stay within the walker. That's how it gives the best support for you. You don't want the walker out too far and you're chasing the walker like this. Mm -hmm. You want to keep your, your um, back straight and in a good posture. It can be difficult to accept the help that mobility equipment and devices can offer. Remember that these are simply tools that you can choose to use to help you be more independent, do more for yourself, and go more places. Your caregivers will benefit too when you choose to use assistive devices. You may want to consider the pros and cons of using equipment, weighing the advantages, cost and practicality. You should probably consider a, a wheelchair as an option. Um, you, you've been using a walker effectively, but it sounds like the walker is uh, not quite enough. And I'm concerned about your, you know, using too much energy and not having energy left to do other things. and then. I'm concerned about your safety. Uh, you know, I, I don't want you falling down. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think for those two reasons, you might. I think you need to start considering using a wheelchair. Uh, how do you feel about that? It's a hard jump. Yeah. It's hard. I know. What about the decision to use your motorized vehicle? Tell us what led up to that decision. Obviously, your legs were becoming weaker and you were having more trouble with getting around. Was it hard for you to accept the idea of having a wheelchair or a vehicle for mobility? Well, it, it's a, it was another thing that you can think of in both ways. I'm giving into this. I'm losing another battle. Now I'm in, I'm in a wheelchair, which the Veterans Administration has supplied for me. And they have supplied the scooter. Well. I don't see it as giving it again. It's just another tool that I need to work. And I like to continue working. And I'm going to do anything that can keep me active and keep me busy. I don't like sitting around at the house. I like to hunt every year. And this takes me hunting. The decision to use this again was something that I needed, like the bypass. It was something that would allow me to continue my life and not be sedentary in any way that restricted me. And I like to stay active. And this helped. Well, to me, the biggest thing is the electric wheelchair. Because without it, 
I'm, I have a sense of being trapped. That is, I can only go where somebody pushes me. I can only turn where somebody pushes me. Uh, if I roll into an elevator, I, I'm just rolled in and I look at a wall sort of thing. With an electric wheelchair, I can, I can go where I want. I can turn where I want. I'm still actively hiking. I even call it hiking. Uh, I can go six or seven miles on this wheelchair and keep up with the fastest hiker I ever did in the past. Uh, the wheelchair really makes a difference. When I'm not in the wheelchair, I kind of feel like a uh, sack of potatoes. I mean, basically, I'm just pulled around. I mean, I, I have no mobility without this chair. So I really like the chair. Yes, it's, it's been wonderful because it gives us the ability to get out and go where we have not really been able to go easily before. I tried to stay away from the wheelchair as much as I could because uh, getting into the wheelchair on top of the guy was going to be a, uh, a defeat against the disease, which I wanted to, of course, to fight, and I'm still fighting it. But after falling a few times, the last one hurting my head, I decided to get on a chair. And uh, I got this chair that completely can be independent, to be all over the place where I wanted to go. And uh, I did not miss walking that much because I could go with a chair wherever I could walk it, and also a lot safer. So again, once I saw the benefits and that my life could be as normal as possible with a chair, I adapted to it very quick. I think his sense of independence and my mental relief over the fact that he is able in wheelchair accessible facilities to get through doors, to get through elevators, to go where he needs to go without my being right at his side every single second gives him his independence and it gives me a certain measure of independence too. Consult with a wheelchair seating specialist before making any wheelchair decision. Occupational therapists, physical therapists, and wheelchair vendors will use their knowledge and experience with ALS and the equipment to advise you about which chair will meet your current and future needs. You need to get a wheelchair that's going to grow with you. Initially, you probably only need a manual wheelchair. When you're looking at power electric wheelchairs, you want to get one that has enough stability and the electronic interfaces so that as you go from being able to drive it with your hand to your head to another body part, the electronics are there for the switching. Choosing a wheelchair that is adaptable for future needs is a must. Many people need neck and head supports, armrests, and the ability to add switches. Electronic switches can be added to equipment so that you can control devices such as a wheelchair with very slight movement of any muscle. Whether you use a manual or electric wheelchair, a proper cushion is important. There are many different kinds of cushions that can improve your positioning, increase your comfort, and assist you when you go from the wheelchair to a standing position. We can raise the chair and then I can help him with all the personal items that he needs, shaving, you know, things of that nature. Uh, and it just makes life tremendously more easy just to be able to have that feature where that chair will go up and down. Coordinating the purchase of a van and power wheelchair is important to be sure that your chair will fit into the van. Uh, the wheelchair really makes a difference. It's been wonderful because it gives us the ability to get out and go where we have not really been able to go easily before. Uh, the van has just been super. It's, it's very easy to have Paul roll in. We get up, we go. We don't stay home. <laughs> Some vans are more convenient than others for wheelchair access. A reclining position may be necessary for head clearance on entering the van. Factors to look for are sufficient headroom once you are in the van and the turning radius inside. Tie-down safety belts are a necessity. Safety and comfort for you and your caregiver are of prime importance in moving from one place to another. We're going to do a sit-pivot transfer, and what you want to do is make sure that the arm of the chair comes off so that you don't have to worry about making it over that. It makes the transfer a little easier. And then you want to have Kevin mm -hmm. scoot all the way up to the edge of the chair. You're pretty much there, right? Mm -hmm. You can do one of two things. You can keep your knees on both sides of his knees or just on one side. Um, of his leg like that, just to support and help him over to the chair, okay? You want to make sure that your head is always facing the direction 
that you're going. So if I was going to here, I want my head here and not here so that I can see where I'm going. Okay, I'm going to scoot back on the chair. First, we'll talk about the position of the caregiver. Uh, when you bend, if you bend like this, you'll hurt your back. Your hips are actually here, even though you think of your hips as being here. So you actually have to bend like a linebacker, actually, uh, <laughs> because you have big bottom muscles and very little uh, spine muscles. First, we'll work on scooting to the edge of the chair. If they're not able to help that much, then you could have the patient lean to one side, and you take their bottom and their leg, and you kind of walk each cheek towards the edge of the chair, like that. Use of good body mechanics is very important to prevent injuries. Devices such as a transfer belt or gate belt and transfer boards are helpful tools. You can either grab someone by their uh, pants waist, you can get under their bottom. If you try and grab someone by their arms, it's not really very useful because the, the arms will move when you try and grab them. Now we're going to demonstrate using a sliding board. This is a plain one. This is a Beasy board. Some people have found helpful for getting into and out of cars. The way you would use this Beasy board would be some people can't uh, lift their leg up themselves so that you would need to help maybe by crossing one leg and getting this under their bottom. And you don't want their flesh hanging over this edge because then once they slide over it's going to get pinched over <laughs> here. So we stick that under your bottom. So lean forward. And I'll count to me, one, two, three. And the rest of the way, I'll do like a sitting pivot lean forward, blocking her legs, squatting, one, two, three. Take that out, and then to help Mim scoot back in the chair, I'll have her lean forward. So I'm going to push with my knee on her, the end of her knee. When she leans forward, I'll count to three, one, two, three. Three. Lift devices can assist you and your caregiver. Seat lifts can help you get from a wheelchair or upholstered chair. Electric and hydraulic lifts can be portable, ceiling, or wall mounted. These provide effective transfers and make it safe for a small person to move a larger, heavier person. As I saw my mobility uh, decreasing, the fact that I wanted to keep being in independent. Jerry is great, has been a wonderful support, but I didn't want him to have to take me everywhere. So I've been looking ahead. And as I saw that my driving was coming to an end, I heard through another ALS patient that hand controls were a possibility. And I didn't even think hand controls. So. Indeed, I took the lessons to drive with hand controls, passed the test, and we have them installed on our sedan. I push for the brake and pull for gas, and then I have a knob for steering. I can drive myself. I get to where I'm going. It gives me a measure of independence that even without a wheelchair, I can get out without him having to take me everywhere. That is extremely important to me. We decided that we wanted to take a vacation. Um, we've always done quite a bit of vacationing and traveling and um, because of the ALS uh, obviously there's lots of limitations uh, centered primarily around the wheelchair but there's other things as well. Um, so I set out to plan my vacation like I normally would and in the course of doing that I got on the internet and uh, read various things about vacations that other dis disabled people had taken. Eventually my wife found on the internet um, a travel group, uh, a tour company that specialized in taking small groups of people in wheelchairs and uh, touring Australia. So there weren't any worries and we went on the trip. It was a three-week trip. We got to do everything from helicopter rides to balloon rides, riding on antique trains, um, we got to go out on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, we spent three weeks touring all over Australia and had a fantastic time.
I had lovely Persian and Oriental rugs upstairs in my bedroom and by my bathroom and in my hall. I just bit the bullet and decided to roll them up because I had fallen, tripped on a throw rug, and I know they're classic problems for people with mobility problems. There are a number of simple, inexpensive ways you can increase your safety at home and reduce the risk of falling. Keep a cordless phone handy. Install secure grab bars throughout the bathroom and other locations where you need a strong support to hold. Sturdy shoes are a must. Many people think that using braces will lead to further weakening and atrophy of their muscles. It's not so. Lightweight polypropylene uh, ankle, foot, orthoses that will hold the foot up and prevent the foot from slapping or from catching the toe. These are invaluable in improving the safety and the confidence and the endurance of walking. When you have a wheelchair, a lot of people forget to lock the brakes. They lock one side. They'll leave a footrest down, and they'll try to sit on the chair when it's moving. This feels easy, okay. but I'm worried when I'm outside and on a sidewalk and there's a crack, and the wheel could get stuck in the crack. What do I do? You have to be especially careful when you're when you're outside because of yeah. the different levels of pavement and, and that type of thing especially on like the curves even the curves that have the ramp have that small lip that you right. have to to bring it over when you're walking over with a rolling walker what you want to do is if you can roll it up the a little lip mm -hmm. roll it over it don't pick it up I see. if you have to pick it up then you just want to pick it up very very like very slightly just enough to make it over mm -hmm. whatever the the difficulty is and then put the wheels right back down on the floor. The ability to call for help is imperative. It's often overlooked and I have two different devices here. This is a simple remote control wireless door chime that I purchased at Lowe's. It will travel 200 feet within any vicinity and the individual would just press this button and call for help. Most of your activities of daily living can be made easier by using several of these adaptive devices. Use trays so that you don't have to carry items. A lot of times you have difficulties holding items and carrying and walking and you drop things and this can be a way to conserve your energy as well as to be safe. Keep appliances and pans close to your waist so that you do not have to extend your arms or reach up and down, tiring your arms and your hands. You can put an item in the oven and instead of reaching in, you can use the stick to help push it back in. This can be used to turn pages on a book or to even strike the keys on the keyboard. This is a universal cuff palm writing apparatus where when you can't hold a pencil in your fingers, it holds it in your palm for you and then you just kind of use your whole arm to write with. Most of these helpful devices are inexpensive and easy to find. Using these sorts of items will make writing, dressing, and eating easier and quicker for you. Adaptive equipment in the bathroom makes it more accessible and safer for you to use the toilet and shower or tub. A raised toilet seat will make transfers easier and safer. An ideal shower adaptation includes a shower with no lip on the floor so a wheelchair can roll right in. Sturdy grab bars are a necessity. Using a chair or tub bench will increase your safety and help you conserve energy. Long-handled scrub brushes will help you wash hard-to-reach body parts easily. It is not uncommon to experience fatigue, especially at the end of the day or with exertion. Using energy conservation techniques and labor-saving devices can make a big difference. If I go 100 yards, it's too far. And if you go that far, you're, you pay for it. You're tired. I struggle with my walker and I can only go a short distance before I'm exhausted. And then I have to come home and take a nap, and it's getting harder and harder. Think very critically about what it is that you're doing um, during the course of the day, and what is it that you can either relinquish to someone else or change so that you have a little bit more energy to do the things that you really want to, whether it's continuing to work, which we have a lot of patients who are basically either quadruparetic or quadruplegic that are out there in the community and, and continuing to work, or whether it's going out and being able to spend time with their grandchildren. So again, it's a quality of life and productivity issue for the patients. Grandchildren like it too. <laughs>
A few changes to your home can make a big difference in allowing you to go where you want to go. Many of these adaptations can be made in an existing home. If your home has steps that make going in and out difficult, a ramp can be built to provide easier access for walkers and wheelchairs. For access over the threshold or a small step, a portable ramp may work. Plastic sheets can provide a firm surface for wheelchairs and walkers. We went with carpet, which is a Berber carpet, which is a very low, dense pile, and it works quite well, not only with the electric wheelchair, but also with the manual wheelchair. Some people may elect to move from a multi-level home into a more accessible house. Adaptations can be designed at the early stages of construction, but many of the adaptations you'll see here can be made in older homes, too. First of all, in the bathroom, when I moved into the condo, it's got a tub. A tub is absolutely no use to me because I can't get in there. So what we did was to take out the tub and we made the area uh, a shower area with a little bit of a ramp so that we could roll a chair in and the water would drain away and not, of course, flood the uh, bathroom itself. Inventive adaptations for the bathroom can make it much easier to bathe and to use the toilet. Simple changes, such as the height of light switches and heat controls, can help you be more independent. We removed certain doors so that there would be easy access into the bathroom. Doorways can be widened and pocket doors or folding doors installed. You can have inside doors removed to allow wheelchair access. The mobility solutions in this video can help you be more mobile and independent. We encourage you to be inventive and find even more solutions that work for you. With ALS, knowledge is power. The ALS Association is here to help you and your family throughout your journey with ALS. The ALS Association provides information, equipment, support, and a number of programs and local services throughout the country. Contact the ALS Association's national office or your local chapter for more information and help. We have different types of walkers, wheelchairs, hospital beds, Hoyer lifts. The ALS Association thanks the people with ALS, their families, and health care providers who provided the inspiration for this video and who welcomed us into their homes and their lives. Don't wait on getting your equipment and learning how to prepare your house with regard to dealing with the ALS patient. Be in a proactive state of mind. This video and others in the ALS Association's Living with ALS series is provided without charge thanks to the generosity of our individual donors. <laughs>